Uh, Rodrigo, and thank you for for your time. Uh, and I just want to start by by asking you, you know, a generic question, but I think it's it's quite general. So, how did the idea for this particular uh, documentary come come about? How did you meet Dutch on and Cecilia? You know, and how did you decide to to produce this documentary? So, with documentaries, for me, it's never really about an idea. Mm -hmm. The ideas come afterwards as you start sort of going into the world of the, your participants and their universe, both emotional and physical. Uh, for me, it was just, it's a confluence of two things. One is that the South, uh, since the, uh, I would say the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, has been um, living under the, this sort of giant demographic revolution called the Great Latino Migration, in which millions of Latin Americans uh, moved into the South of the United States which previously had never seen large, massive populations of Spanish-speaking migrants settling in. They came through as migrants picking, you know, tobacco, sweet potatoes, uh, um, on their way to, to Maine, to New York, to pick blueberries and apples, but never really settling down. There was little small pockets of maybe academics uh, here and there, maybe when the Cubans were sent to Tennessee, the Los Marielitos number two, I think, but never, never such a huge um, settling of Latin American speaking languages directly from Latin America and half of them from Mexico. So there's that universe that is happening. And I, for myself as a migrant, and I'm Chileno, right? And I'm from Chile. And I had, by the early 90s, I had pretty much given up going back to Chile. Uh, and I was sort of stuck here in the South, which is kind of an alien place. Uh, it is both the South is very recognizable because it's a it, it is filled with um, colonial traditions, right? Very much like in America, but uh, mostly not in the language. Nobody speaks Spanish back then. It was very no bilingualism. The streets don't have our name. It feels a little bit like the moon. Um, and then suddenly Latin America started coming to my doorstep just when I thought I'd just, where was I? And so for me as a documentary filmmaker, as an archivist, as a chronicler, I started getting very much involved in this, in this great sort of transformation of the South via Latin America coming into it and changing it because of the impact that had never happened before. Uh, and so in that, in that, and that's the context in which I find myself seven or eight years ago in a, uh, Caripeo, a bull riding rodeo of the Mexican bull riding circuit in a tiny little town in North Carolina that used to host bull ridings for the Anglos, but it now is, it is not happening anymore. And Los Tigres del Norte were playing in a small little venue with like maybe 3,000 people. So that was like very exciting. And that was my first entry into the world of Caripeo, the, you know, the sort of the culture of the, of, of the, of, of in the music and in the the sort of the the whole mythology of that sort of attachment also to feasts of saints. In this one, it wasn't a feast; it was just a big party. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, I get attached to feasts, and that's when I met Tacho, who is a wrangler, and my friend Peter Eversol, and my producer, who worked with me and has been traveling, used to work through North Carolina and, and rural counties. He knew Tacho a little bit here and there, and then um, I got introduced to him, and then one thing led to another. And we, uh, Tacho then invited us to his quinceañera of the, his son's quinceañera, Alan, and he was going to give a quinceañera to his boy. And it was going to be, of course, a jaripeo, the first time that Alan gets to pull the, you know, pull the doors. And so mm -hmm. we filmed that. And then we were working in the middle of a project about quinceañeras, but that fell through in terms of the jaripeo aspect of it. And we slowly got sucked into their lives, um, sucked into their, um, we, we slowly became sort of bridges between them and Chiran. We became friends. Um, you know, Peter taught Alan how to drive, that kind of thing, where, where it, was, it, it was a very intimate relationship mm -hmm. that developed. And at some point, we, we, I saw a story there that very much echoed my own story of exile, because I lived in exile for most of my youth, and of um, distance and of nostalgia and of loss and of what it feels to live between two worlds and that's where that's the idea that's the feeling that's where i went and i saw oh there's a story here um and then we slowly started evolving that relationship of what it means to collaborate mm -hmm. uh, together in creating a story so that it's not just uh, uh you're not duplicating sort of power relations 
of 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 authority, for example, but that you are to a, a point collaborating as much as possible and co-creating stories. Because obviously it's reality that's evolving. I have no control over it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why it took seven years, because it took a long right. time for the story to sort of land. Uh, and you know, and it's ironic that it landed in limbo. <laughs> it did not land in precision as I thought it would for many years. Mm -hmm. So uh, how involved are you in uh, in the community in, in North Carolina? Do you see like many uh, potential stories uh, developing at, at the same time? Just asking because of how this one you know came to be. Uh, how is your daily life something uh, that you maybe think uh, you know? Uh, I'll go to, to this event, I'm getting invited to this and that. And, you know, do you always see potential stories um, happening or what is uh, your approach to combining, you know, the your life, your daily life, your involvement in, in the community and, you know, maybe uh, seeing more ideas for, for documentaries? So I, I was in Hollywood for a while and I've traveled around the world and I decided when I started seeing these transformations, I decided to stay here. Not only because it's where my family is, also because my children were born here. So I became caught and that sort of, I bought a house. Here are my kids. And it's exactly sort of the mirror of what happened to everyone else who came. And like in the movie, Tatcha says, you know, everybody comes for a year and you stay 19. In la, jaula, la jaula de oro, no? The golden cage that it's called many times. For me, to tell you the truth, the reason I'm not going any, I mean, the reason I don't need to go anywhere to find stories, it's because North Carolina or La Carolinas, as one would call it, so it's South Carolina and North Carolina, La Carolina, mm -hmm. and the South in general, which of course, ironically, for many of us is a Norte, and then you come here and then you're in the South, you're like, okay, that's kind of strange, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is one of the richest, most vibrant places that I have ever seen. And of course, I I'm in it, but at the same time, the South always has been fascinating. Very interesting place. It's just that this added dimension of the Latin American dimension. Imagine if you were in Brooklyn in 1920 and the Italians just arrived. Well, instead of Italians, it's Mexicans. It's that idea, right? They just mm -hmm. arrived, just arrived with all their traditions intact, not assimilated. So like that scene from The Godfather, right? When, when the Nero is following the guy and it's Santa, Santa Selmo, I think. Uh, and you think, oh, you're in Sicily. It's the same, right? Imagine if you'd been there in 1920 with a with a video camera and the technology that we have today. Mm -hmm. Back in time, would you want to go anywhere else? No, the, the, the richness of it is so incredible. And so right now, for example, so I've been telling many stories for the 30 for the last 30 years, and I've been one of the main chroniclers of the great Latino migration to the South, just because of luck and chance and talent and possibility and commitment i have stayed mm -hmm. so I, i'm one of the few sort of institutional memories that there are among some others and right now for example i am working i'm off to mexico next week to go follow a story called the dream of the bear about an azteca dancer in durham that went back to mexico to atlix slack and who took on the spirit of a bear literally so with a, a bear that he had, that he bought with a you know the head and El Espíritu, no? And uh, I'm going to go finish the story that I filmed him for two years here as an Azteca dancer. I'm also working on something called La Paquis, which is the story of, the, of, of one of the first. And there's a lot of first in the South for Latinos. And that makes it very vibrant. If you're in Los Angeles, a lot of things have been done for many times. Uh, it's the um, the, for the story of the one of the oldest, the, the first um, drag queens in the South, LGBTQ Latino drag queen, La Paquis. Um, and I'm working on that also. And also I'm working on something called the making of the Nova South, which is a gigantic uh, um, project that started as a TV series through a, a fellowship that I got through ITVS and the NEH. And that one's looking for its form. Um, that one has like 10 stories inside of it uh, that are each one worthy of a one hour documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just the beginning. And of course, I'm also doing part two of Bulls and Saints called El Desobediente that we were filming in parallel all these years and we had to separate about a bull rider that comes over, crosses the border to ride El Dollar and Alan, who's one of the participants, his life has changed because he's always wanted to be a bull rider, but now he can like, oh my God, my uncle is a bull rider, famous, and it changes his dynamics. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little 
to to answer to 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 answer your question yes every day there is something going on every day mm -hmm. there, every day there's a story and this is why i'm particularly i'm right now working on training latino youth who finally have come of age uh because there's just too many stories and they're getting lost and i can't do them all training them in uh documentary making is that yes yeah i've created something called the center for the nuevo south mm -hmm. out of my experience of trying to create uh, the making of the Nova South, which is this TV series, and I realized I didn't have the capacity to do it in a way that's non-extractive and community-centered, uh, which means that if I'm going to be consequential with my community involvement, with my activism, with my desire to um, uh, empower communities, my community to tell their own stories, uh, they have to be able to have the capacity to do it and the knowledge and the talent and the time. And so I am, um, through some granting, I'm working with Latino youth and uh, just giving them the space to create uh, equipment, granting, uh, guidance, uh, which doesn't exist because one of the things that happened in the South is that when we came here, as I said, it was like you landed on the moon. There are no institutions in the South, um, like the Center for the Nuevo South, which is what I created, what has to do with the history, the memory of the Latino, great Latino migration, the archiving, the uh, promoting of memory, the keeping of the memory, the idea of this history that is barely 30 years old, there's not a single institution from New Orleans to New York, because the Smithsonian doesn't really deal with this, uh, our South. The Smithsonian, Latino Smithsonian is still stuck in this Chicano borderline narrative. Uh, and that's actually very important to understand that when people think of the South, they think of Texas and Miami a lot of the times, because that's where the centers of power are, cosmopolitan centers in the South, in Atlanta. But Atlanta only with Latinos because they vote and they can maybe sway the election. But culturally speaking, the South, um, the way I see it, the American South, the Latino South, the New South, the Nuevo South, ¿verdad? Is, uh, is, not my, is not Florida or Texas. It's everything else. So it's kind of like the Confederacy in a way. And that South, is almost invisible, ignored, uh, forgotten in terms of like, you know, where uh, um, money goes and granting and facilities. So there's not a single institution. <laughs> I mean, you, you ask yourself, how can that be? There's not a single institution between Louisiana, between New Orleans and New York, that is trying to address culture, memory, archiving, documentation, the way I'm trying to do in my tiny little, you know, ways and we just got started uh, but that's that's to me that's like sort of the kernel of it too the importance of storytelling in the south is that if we don't train if we don't tell our stories 50 years from now we're going to be just like the italians who forgot their language forgot their recipes and you know it's just pizza and spaghetti and some things um not not to you know insult the italians <laughs> <laughs> for what they've done it's just that's how america works america assimilates you into whiteness uh that's been the story and the question is can we here in the south as latinos as latin americans find a different way to enter into the into the conversation of a more perfect union especially with the 250th anniversary coming up in 20 2026 can is there here a different way to create um a narrative a migrant narrative that is distinctly different from all the other narratives that have come before that is not assimilation mm -hmm. um that's that's the fascinating part that we're integrating ourselves and because america is in such boiling that um there's openings for uh for a new way to to create new uh, sort of hybrid multicultural truly multicultural spaces